Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come. Good morning, metalheads of the internet, and welcome to a new episode of The Metal Meltdown. Today, the prophesied times have arrived. We are finally talking about the best heavy metal of 2020. First, let's go over a couple of ground rules. First off, if I did not review it on The Metal Meltdown, it is not eligible to appear on my list. And second, and most importantly, I want to make it clear, this is not a ranked list. I am not going from best to worst. I am not going from worst to best. I am not going number 10, number 9, number 7, coming in at number 6. My list has been arranged by order of released. So albums that were released in January and February, we're going to talk about first. And albums that were released in October, November, we're going to talk about last. Now that doesn't mean I don't have a number one favorite album of the year. What it means is I am simply just going to tell you what that album is when we address it. I feel like that's all clear. I certainly hope it is. Let's not waste any more fucking time. Here are, in my opinion, the best metal albums of 2020. First off, let's go over some honorable mentions, some albums that I thoroughly enjoyed but unfortunately just did not make the final cut. The first of these is Split from Kavellertak an exciting, progressive, ambitious, and adventurous fusion of hardcore punk, classic rock, black metal, and traditional heavy metal. It is just a hyper catchy, fun, and engaging record from start to finish, full of attitude, full of moxie, and quite possibly, Kavellertuck's best record yet. My second honorable mention is Hypnagogic Hallucinations, the debut album from Bedsore. Through this album, Bedsore have managed an incredibly delicate, emotional, and powerful blend of progressive death metal, melodic death metal, and old school American death metal. Making for an album that is every bit as lush as it is grim. An album that is every bit as evocative as it is demanding. Backed up by some amazing songcraft and some amazing performances. This album, more than any other of my honorable mentions, was the closest to being on the final 10. And that brings us now to my final honorable mention, Plena Noquar from Fuck the Facts, and yet another incredibly powerful, diverse, nihilistic, and utterly brutal record from Canadian underground grind masters Fuck the Facts. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about this album since my review for this went up pretty recently, but I will say... Napalm Death was an honorable mention on this list until this Fuck the Facts record showed up. This album single-handedly knocked Napalm Death completely out of the fucking running. Booyah, ladies and gentlemen, now that that's out of the way, let's officially dive into my top 10, starting with Fluid Existential Inversions from Intronaut, released February 28th via Metal Blade Records. This album shows Intronaut's unique and unorthodox brand of progressive metal at its most exciting, immersive, and ambitious. It is spacey, it is wild, it is unpredictable to the point of being almost accidentally psychedelic. The musicianship is remarkable, masterfully tight, with a kind of improvisational edge and flow that I would expect from a jazz band rather than a metal band. With crisp, clear, striking, evocative guitars, pungent and poignant bass guitar, often dominating the forefront of the sound, weird proggy keyboards and synthesizers, angular, almost mathematical patterns and percussion, and binded by a concept that itself questions the progression of mankind and civilization. It's definitely not for everybody, even I will admit that it took me a few listens to really appreciate what Intronaut was trying to do here, but once it stuck to me, it fucking stuck to me, and I have not wanted it to unstick ever since. Next up, we have Underneath from Code Orange, released March 13th via Roadrunner Records. I know that we're kind of early into the video, but I told you, ladies and gentlemen, I would tell you what my number one album was when we approached it. And believe it or not, we have indeed approached it. Code Orange's Underneath is my favorite metal album of the year. It is also my favorite album of the year in any genre, and in my opinion, perhaps one of the most important albums of the year altogether. 
It is their heaviest album yet, their most ambitious album yet, at times their most terrifying album yet. Immaculately produced, overflowing with thick, hearty, industrial grooves, insane percussion, striking melodies, a lot of very glitchy and uncomfortable soundscapes that constantly jar and shock at every single turn, making for the band's most punishing material, their most poignant material, and I'm gonna say it, their most addicting material even. Not a single day has gone by where I am not singing one song from this album in my head. Not one single day. As we are sitting here right now, I literally have the chorus to the album's title track wedged into my fucking brain. Its fusion of metalcore, alternative metal, and industrial metal is so fucking powerful. The performances are so fucking incredible. And despite being inherently quite digital by default, mechanical by default, there is still so much humanity and authenticity underneath all of this. No pun intended. And while this may come down to a purely personal thing, I would like to point out the timing of this album's release helps a lot. This album came out at the beginning of quarantine here in Southern Ontario and just immediately tapped in to the anguish, the torment, and the fear that I was feeling in that time. It quite literally became my soundtrack to the non-stop apocalypse that is 2020. And for all those reasons, and probably many more that we don't really have time to discuss, because there are eight other records we need to talk about, this is not only one of my favorite albums of the year, this is my number one favorite album of the year, period. Well, almost period. Another album came dreadfully close, but we'll cross that particular bridge when we get there. Next up, we have Come Forth to Me from Acurion, released April 10th via Redefining Darkness. This debut album from this Canadian technical death metal supergroup featuring members of Cryptopsy, Cattle Decapitation, and Neuraxis has been in the making for a very, 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 very long time. So long that the debut single for this album, if you want to call it that, came out back in 2015. And furthermore, in an interview I had with the band's lead singer, Mike DeSalvo, he implied that material for Curion was in the works long before even that. There are a multitude of reasons as to why this album took so long to be released, but the most noteworthy of which has to do with the aforementioned Mike DeSalvo and the passing of his wife Genevieve. While most of the album had been completed in 2017, the project in its entirety was put on hiatus out of respect for Mike and his late wife, Genevieve. And while obviously this little factoid does nothing to actively enhance the music, seeing as how most of it was written and recorded before Genevieve's passing, it does indirectly enhance so much of what is on this album. Suddenly, Come Forth to Me isn't just a masterclass of epic proportions in how to execute true Canadian death metal, it is also a surprisingly vulnerable record for Acurion and for Mike DeSalvo in particular, as he confronts his demons and the passing of his wife through song. What would have been devastating is now heartbreaking. What would have been brutal is now, oh god, so brutal. As the album simultaneously spreads its incredible and unique Canadian darkness and a kind of brotherly love that you don't really see in death metal at all. And yet y'all are sleeping on this thing. Like, holy fuck, my review is the only one I can find online. Maybe I need to look harder. That's a fair comment before someone says it. But what the fuck? Stop fucking sleeping on this thing. Because Come Forth to Me from Acurion is one of the most powerful tech death records in recent memory and one of the most powerful records of 2020, period. Next up, we have Mestaren Kinsey from Oranzi Pazuzu, released April 17th via Nuclear Blast Records. I've always appreciated Oranzi Pazuzu, but I've always done so somewhat from afar. I've never quite gelled with their particular brand of incredibly experimental and progressive black metal. In fact, even this album that I'm about to lavish with absolute undeniable praise took a while to really stick with me. The killer is I can't even pinpoint when exactly this record just blossomed and exploded for me, but whenever it was, once it did, 
oh my god, I saw this album for the true beauty that it was. It unfolded like some kind of beautiful flower, poisoned by the darkness of black metal. This album is absolutely twisted, to put it lightly. Aranci Pazuzu is not a band on this album. They are some kind of unstoppable, bloodthirsty creature rampaging through a city, destroying nearly everything in sight. The album is malicious, it is sinister, it is uncontrollable, unpredictable. And yet, this album doesn't feel quite as overwhelming and jarring as it probably should be, and probably would be, in the hands of any other band. Instead, it's oddly quite inviting. It's pretty easy to find yourself lost within this album's sonic universe, within its many layers. Thanks to its psychedelic flourishes, its shape-shifting nature, and the constant mystery and tension that this album builds up. Like, even on my first listen, back when I wasn't really sure how I felt about this album, I was so deeply intrigued and fascinated by it. I, I would sit there and I'd go, I don't know if I like this, but I really want to fucking see where it goes. Probably isn't going to be for everyone. That's fine. I, I totally understand that. But I love it, and I cannot wait to see Aranci Pazuzu just get weirder and crazier as time goes on and on. Next up, and this might be a little bit of a surprise for some of you, hell, it's even a little bit of a surprise for me, but next up, Providence by Ulthar, released June 12th via 20 bucks spin. Now, I liked this album when it came out. I liked it a lot. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5, I bought it on vinyl, I spin it every now and then. It's a pretty good record. And I kind of resigned to that exact thought for a while, just like, yeah, it's a pretty good record. I'm gonna listen to it, because it's a pretty good record. But then I kind of realized something. I'm listening to this album a lot, and then I noticed that every time I go back to it, I'm finding something new, I'm finding something weirder, I'm finding something grosser, I'm finding something more perverse, more destructive, and, and next thing you know, I'm just uh, completely wrapped within this album's utterly bizarre and genuinely disturbing little world. I can't think of any other record from the realm of death metal, from the broader realm of extreme music, that is quite as perverted and carnivorous as Providence. An absolutely psychotic sound that consistently pummels the mind and challenges the senses with influences from black metal, progressive metal, with foreboding acoustic guitars and ominous grooves covered in slime and bodily matter slowly wrapping itself around you like a python strangling its prey. Granted, a python with a fucking dick on its head, but a python nonetheless. It just absolutely fucking rips. An album that really does emphasize the extreme of extreme metal. Like, y'all are talking about Necrod and Benediction and Undeath, and that's all fine and good, but but this is, this is the king of weird, gross, extreme death metal mountain. The Chad Ulthar and the Virgin everyone else. Next up, we have Palimpsest by Protest the Hero, released June 18th independently with the help of Sheets Happening Publishing. Protest the Hero have always been a very over-the-top and bombastic prog metal band, to the point where they have even deterred some of prog metal's most avid listeners. And I think for that reason alone, an album as inherently, objectively gigantic as Palimpsest was doomed to fail, at least in the eyes of those aforementioned prog metal nerds. Which is fine, I guess, for the record. There's obviously no rule that says we all have to agree. But respectfully, um, um, y'all are wrong on this. This is Protest the Hero's most epic, inventive, ambitious, and authentic record to date. As the band combine their hyper-melodic, hyper-technical, hyper-explosive prog metal sound with stories of American surrender, loss, love, and death. As the band rally in objection to nationalism, capitalism, religious hypocrisy, calling out America and, by extension, the rest of modern civilization for being so actively gullible, for choosing to ignore the atrocities on which our nations are built. 
The music is just absolutely rock solid. The guitars, the percussion, the bass work, the string instruments, the orchestral parts, the symphonic rock influence flowing throughout this album's veins, emboldening and raising so much of what is already so powerful to new and unexpected levels. Not to mention the absolutely stellar vocal performance from Rhodey Walker, who I'm amazed can even talk properly after recording so many over-the-top punishing choruses and deliveries. It's an album that doesn't just deliver exciting, beautiful, and inspired music. It challenges you to be a better person, to be a better citizen, to really look at the history of the nation, of the world that you live in. And while it's a shame that some people just aren't interested in that, it's that exact mentality that makes Palimpsest so important and so powerful still at the end of 2020. Next up, we have Alphaville from Imperial Triumphant, released July 21st via Century Media Records. Imperial Triumphant has been responsible for some truly mind-melting music in the last couple of years, and as a result, I was obviously expecting more or less the same from Alphaville. What I was not expecting was for my mind to actually be reduced to fucking goo. What I was not expecting for Imperial Triumphant to emerge with, no pun intended, their most triumphant record to date. Their most complicated, their most bizarre, their most immersive, their most challenging. Throughout the entirety of this album, I am finding myself consistently crushed by thick and oppressive walls of blackened death metal with horns and strings often piercing out of the dark to try and provide light, to try and provide color and relief. Aided by smooth, sensual pianos creating genuinely beautiful and heartaching contrast. Aided by dystopian themes and taiko drums performed by a member of Mashuga, And by a fucking barbershop quartet and some incredibly puzzling and, and angular musicianship that taps into your paranoia, that taps into your confusion and insanity. It is a truly deranged record to the point of being mentally taxing, and for that reason I've seen some of my peers here on YouTube dismiss the album entirely. Which is a shame, honestly, because I think there's genuine beauty beneath the madness of this record. It is not confusing noise for the sake of confusing noise. There is a larger message, a larger goal. In bringing the Roaring Twenties to the modern era, the album somewhat unintentionally, but nonetheless, highlights just how little has changed in literally a hundred fucking years. And as a result, provided one of the most cathartic and unique experiences I've had with an album in 2020. For those reasons, this album was almost my number one of the year. And while ultimately that title does go to Underneath from Code Orange, I want to make it clear, this is only inches behind. Next up, we have Stygian from Atramentus, released August 21st via 20 Bucks Spin. Much like the aforementioned Acurion, Atramentus is a project that has been in the works for a very, 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 very long time now. With most of this music having been envisioned, written, composed, recorded, and produced nearly 10 years ago. But unlike the aforementioned Acurion, personal tragedy and loss does play directly into what the album offers and to what the album delivers. As the band's leader, Philippe Tuga, penned this music during an incredibly devastating and incredibly depressing period in his life. As such, Atramentus, despite being inherently objectively quite slow and monotonous, also feels quite immediate. The emotion at the core consistently cuts through the fog, consistently cuts through the droning and the monotony, and makes Stygian not necessarily a fun record, but definitely a very captivating and impressive record. As the album almost forces you to wander barren landscapes searching for hope, searching for light, searching for anything really. There are a lot of rich and lush organs. There's influence from gothic metal. There's influence from black metal. There is a very deep, rich, and well-researched and written lore surrounding everything surrounding this project. One that even connects to the lore of yet another project that Phil Tuga has put out, Cathelist. For these reasons, and frankly many more that we don't have the time to discuss, this is probably the most difficult album on my list to really enjoy. This is the album that will require the most patience. This is the album that will require the most time and effort. 
But make no mistake, every minute you spare for this record is rewarded immediately. Put very simply, it's an album so fucking good that it's pretty much single-handedly changed how I feel about the funeral doom genre. Almost on par with how Sunbather from Death Heaven single-handedly changed my mind about how I felt about black metal, or how I Am King from Code Orange single-handedly changed how I felt about metalcore. Next up we have When I Die Will I Get Better from Zavalbar, released September 25th via Translation Lost Records and Church Road Records. I was a big fan of Savalbard's last studio album, It's Hard to Have Hope. I really appreciated how much more emotionally transparent and blunt and unapologetic it was in comparison to a lot of other music released in 2018. Coupled with an incredibly unique sound that saw the band finding a very bizarre and intriguing balance of post-hardcore alternative metal and even traditional black metal. For these reasons, I was very excited to hear this new studio album, When I Die Will I Get Better. But what I wasn't expecting was to form such a strong emotional connection to this record that it, I'll just say it, left me in tears. See, as the band shared their experiences with sexual harassment, sexual assault, rape, anxiety, and dealing with mental illness through song, I was reminded of everything I went through a few years ago with my sister who herself has dealt with a lot of the things expressed on this album. It was as if somebody had taken that frustration, that anger, that anguish, that evil that she had experienced, and translated it quite literally into song. I was reminded many nights of where I held my sister and she cried in her arms, unsure of what to do next. I was reminded of when I had to go see her in a psychiatric hospital because she was just at that low of a point in her life. And I was also reminded of her perseverance, her resilience, her genuine desire to get better. But of course, it's not just mushy-gushy stuff. The music is anthemic, it is well-produced, it is visceral. I love how fierce and uncompromising it is. I think Savalbar are one of the most unique things to emerge out of black metal and out of alternative music in the last few years, and this record is their most powerful, ambitious, emotional, and engaging record to date. It probably won't have the same effect on you that it had on me. I totally understand that. I might be in the minority here, but nonetheless, I highly encourage you check this thing out, if you haven't already. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to our final album on this list, A Romance with Violence from Wayfarer, released October 16th via Profound Lore Records. This album delivers an ambitious Wild West and black metal crossover of epic proportions that I never really thought I wanted until I got it. Instead of focusing on Satan and Vikings and cold Norwegian landscapes, the album directs its attention to gunslingers, the unforgiving landscape of the old Wild West and the birth of the American Industrial Revolution. Truly brutal stories of revenge, redemption, survival, and being forced to face the inevitable. The result is consistently very tense, very epic, very dirty, very gritty. You can practically feel dirt and sand being kicked up in the air. You can practically smell stale bourbon and whiskey. And you can almost literally hear wild horses rampaging across the desert and lone gunshots echoing in the air. It showcases a completely new direction black metal that I don't really think anybody else has ever really hinted at. Sure, there are some black metal projects that have flirted with the Wild West and with broader Americana themes and influences. Me and That Man comes to mind. To some extent, so does Panopticon. But none of this has ever quite as successfully or literally placed you in the Wild West as A Romance with Violence does. Nor have they provided music as equally exciting or more. I mean, my god, the music on this thing is incredible. I love how acoustic and steel guitars are mixed into the sound. I love all of the weird percussive elements used to build tension and suspense. I love the band's uh, melodic leads and twin guitar parts. I like how epic and thunderous and bloodthirsty so much of this music is. It is just such a remarkable and adventurous record with a spirit unlike anything else you will find within black metal. Wow, and that is it. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but I can tell you I've been recording for 
just about two hours. Ugh. As I said before, Underneath from Code Orange is my favorite metal album of the year and my favorite album of the year in any genre period. Alphaville from Imperial Triumphant is very shortly behind. The rest I'm not sure, but those two I'm pretty sure about. And since we're on the topic, I'm going to officially update the scores for both of those albums to a 5 out of 5. They are truly perfect, one-of-a-kind experiences that I will treasure for years to come. And that is it for me for now. Tell me, what do you think? Do you agree with these selections? Do you disagree? What is on your top 10 for 2020? What is your favorite metal album of the year? Let me know in the comments. I want to know, and I want some spicy debates, so give me your fucking hot takes if you have them. As always, make sure you press subscribe so you get updates on the Metal Meltdown e fucking immediately. And as always, you have yourself a fantastic fucking day.